morning. I want to welcome all of those who are here in the building, but I also want to welcome those who watch on the internet. I realize that several of you actually have a valid reason. You may be out of town, you may be sick, but I believe that some of you simply elected not to be here. And I don't want to pray and force conviction upon you, but whatever means God may need to use to get you in the church, we want you here. Father God, we bring in the place into your hands this service this morning. I pray, Lord God, that my words will be your words. I pray, Father God, that you anoint not only what I say, but I pray, Lord God, that you anoint the hearts of those that are listening. I pray, Father God, you anoint my heart. Let your word take root deep within me, Lord God. Let me be able to live out those things which you pointed out to us in your word. Speak to us, Lord God, I pray today. Father God, through music, through prayer, through testimony, through the word itself, Lord God, I want you to know that we are open to what you have to say. Father God, we pray your blessings upon this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would stand with me this morning for the reading of the word. Psalm 23, read with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You may be seated. We're spending six weeks in total in the six verses that compromise the the 23rd Psalm. Today we're going to look at Psalms chapter 23, and we're going to look specifically at verse 2. Last week we had verse 1. We're going to look at verse Two this week. Psalms 23, 2 says what? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. When we read that, I think when we read that over and over again, I actually just believe that our blood pressure actually goes down and we just get a little bit more at ease and the heart rate comes down and we're just at peace and eased. To know that the Lord makes me lay down in green pastures. To know that he leads me beside the still waters. Something happens and something just takes place when you're on the water. I used to have a place at Spring By. We used to have a place at Toledo Bend. You know, there's just something there. They can prove that if you actually just look at pictures, you know, Marcy gave away a picture the other day and it had a picture of a dock going out in the middle of this beautiful lake, just a big, beautiful picture. And just by even looking at that and placing yourself into that, into the picture, if you would, you just begin to feel calm. There's something that happens when we're in that surrounding. And I began to think, Lord God, what do you have for us? What place do you have for us? In Psalm 23, 2, it kept echoing over and over and over again. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Who is the he in that verse? God. God is the he. He's the same shepherd that we saw in verse 1 when it told us what? that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And sometimes we get a picture in our mind, the Lord is my shepherd, and we... See a man standing there with a wonderful beard like Brother Michael's there. And <laughs> like mine is sometime when my wife allows, if you will. But, but we see that. We see the, the old man with the, with the staff and he's standing there, the shepherd. But you do realize, since we are fully believing in the Trinity, that also standing in that position of the good shepherd is who? Jesus Christ. Christ is our good shepherd. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are there. They are shepherding. They are leading us. Jesus himself said repeatedly in John, if you know the book of John, John chapter 10, oh, I'm a big fan of John chapter 10, 
This is right after John 10, 10, where he told us he's come that we may have life and have more abundantly. He told us how we're going to get that abundant life. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. He told us, he said, I'm the good shepherd. He didn't just give himself a title. You know, people sometimes just give themselves a title. No, he said, I'm going to give myself a title, but I'm going to tell you why I'm worthy of that title. Because I am a good shepherd. I'm a good shepherd because I give my life for my sheep. You understand, I am a shepherd, little s. I've been given this flock right here. I am an under-shepherd to God, the shepherd. You understand that you, all of us, are his sheep. Let me tell you what a good shepherd is. If the over-shepherd ever shows up and there's a hundred dead sheep, there also better be one dead what? Shepherd. He better have fought tooth and nail to the end to save those sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, for I give my life for my sheep. You never have to wonder if he's a good shepherd. There's a thousand different ways you can try to find whether someone's a good pastor. Everybody's opinion's different. I dare say everybody's opinion's wrong. I just think that's the way that it is. I think that we all perceive in what we see someone as and what God wants them to be. And the only person that's really been truly revealed to usually is that person by God. But I will tell you this, that a good shepherd will give his life and will do anything for his sheep. If you continue to read through John, and y'all do that this week when you get a chance. We're actually, in our 21 days, we're in Romans today, but go back and read John chapter 10 again this week. And because John spent several verses there where he says we're Christ. He's reading what Christ said when Christ says over and over again that he's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. But you know, as a good shepherd, occasionally must make us do things that we don't want to do. Remember, it's not me. God gave us the title of being sheep, and sheep are known to be two things. One, not too bright, and two, very hard-headed. Any of you who have children know that there are times when your children have not been the brightest bulb in the chandelier. Not to say they may, they may graduate high honors, top-notch, but you have seen them do things that just make you shake your head and wonder about their paternity. I don't understand how my child could have done something like that. You do realize that God called us sheep. There are times when we're not all that bright and we're hard-headed. It's one thing to be stubborn, but you better be stubborn about something right, not stubborn about something that's wrong. A lot of times I think we believe the wrong thing, and you know where that leads to. As I've said before, we are called into that position, and God gave us that title, but he's given us an opportunity to be able to get out of that situation. Psalm 23, 2, which is what we're focusing on today, gives us that pathway. Psalm 23, 2 says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. It leads me beside the still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Why in the world would you ever have to make someone be still? Why? Why would we ever have to do that? I read something the other day that amazed me. The number of hours and days off every year that people waste, that they don't take their time off from work, that they're just nonstop work, 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 and people are not taking their time off and employ employers having to make people take time off because you do need time to decompress, to unwind. You have to stop every now and then. You just have to. You realize I'm preaching to myself if I was sitting there because I work all the time, pretty much every day. Even the day I'm supposed to be off on Saturday, so there's going to be something there. This week here holds a full work week and two funerals in the week to come. So I'm preaching to myself all the time. I've already heard this message three times this morning myself. I'm preaching to myself. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me do something that sounds so peaceful. I mean, why? Why would you have to make me do that? Because much that we do not like to admit it, we sometimes seem to seek out drama and strife over peace and quiet. Amen. You know somebody like that? You got anybody in your family that things are going well? you nervous because something's about to happen. They cannot live in peace. You may say, I don't have anybody like that in my family. Then chances are that's you. 
If you can't identify one person in your family who's stirring up some drama all the time, it's probably you. Just a fact. Some people's anxiety, and understand me, anxiety and depression, there's a hundred different things that can cause that, and it is a true illness, and it is a true disease, and I think we as the church have neglected dealing with people with that. We've neglected having a heart with them, heart for them that needs to be able to show that we are here for them and we care for them, but understand me, some people's anxiety is caused by their desire and their love of angst. Angst is such a rare using a word, I couldn't even get spell correct to find it for me this morning. Some people live for angst. Some people live for stuff that's just stirred up. Some people introduce themselves, I believe, into a church congregation just to stir things up. They believe that that is their calling. I see elders, deacons, prophets. I see all the callings, the five-fold ministry. I don't see anyone that's ever called to introduce drama. But you know how I know that some people think that's their calling? Because I see how they use it, and they use it as a vocal gift, and that vocal gift to them is called gossip. There are so many people who can talk about the things that are happening in this church in this past year that haven't been here. They're not here. Why are they so worried about what's happening here when they're not here? Because they live on stirring things up. And that gossip is a symptom showing what they're afflicted with and what they're afflicted with is inflicting anxiety upon other people. They are a carrier of the disease. I put in my notes, can't you just be happy and rest in your own business? Can't you just be happy dealing with what you need to deal with without seeking out what's going wrong in somebody else's life? My kids used to say, you do you. You know what? I think that sometimes that's the way to be able to be. I could go a thousand minutes on the whole log in an eye and a speck in an eye and all this stuff, but I don't want to give them any more time. I just want to say that they introduce themselves into there, but we have an opportunity to live outside of the anxiety that they want to bring upon us. We can live in peace in the green pasture that God has brought us to. And if you're not choosing to to rest in that green pasture, it says he's going to do what? He's going to make you because he's a loving God. I've got employees that I make take time off because I love them and I care for them and they need to take time off. There's things they need to deal with and not worried about work. God has given us the opportunity to rest here in our peaceful green pasture. And what we don't need to be doing is looking over the fence at somebody else's pasture. I don't, call, I don't care what color their pasture is because this is the one that God's told me to lay down in. I don't care how many sheep are in their pasture. I don't care. God's given me these sheep. God's given me this to worry about, this to maintain. The rest belongs to someone else. Green pastures, when you read that scripture, green pastures are new growth. If you've ever had anything to do with, hey, a green pasture is one that hasn't been cut. It hasn't been grazed upon. You know the very nature, if you ever pull up a blade of grass, who was that, Les Miles used to eat grass, pull up grass, and you ever pull it, an uncut piece of grass has what? A nice soft shape to it, right? Once it's cut, it gets ragged. When it begins to be ate by animals, it gets ragged. But when that first green pasture that I'm talking about here, it's called a virgin uncut pasture, and it's out there, and it's just so lush, and it's so beautiful, you can just lay back in it. Am I the only person in this building that's ever laid back in a, a little grove, a little growing of um, clover. Am I the only one? We used to be, I thought we were blessed with clover at the house up the road. Dad said we were cursed with it because he couldn't stand clover in his yard. But before he could get to it with the lawnmower, I would just take and I'd just lay out there. And it was so cool and it was just we're exactly where the world was right. It was where we needed to be. And God tells us, I want you to be there. I'm going to make you At some point in time, just lay back in that green pasture and enjoy all that I have for you. How many of you ever have an opportunity to get out to a point in a location where all you can hear is the wind? You can just feel the sunshine and you can just hear the wind and let God speak. God wants us to do that. 
There's a thousand different ways that people say we need to be growing this church. A thousand different activities. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do this. We need to do that. I think what we need to do is be able to get into the word of God and just let him pour out upon us. I think that's what we need to do. I think that's what God wants for us. And the rest of it will come, but we have to be able to yield to the opportunity just to stop and focus on what God wants us to focus on, to listen to his voice. Some people have to always have something going, some kind of a roar. And I think sometimes we just need to stop and hear that still, small voice. I believe that whenever God brings us to a pasture, that he's given us here and now what we need for here and now. I don't know what God has for this church going forward, and it doesn't matter. He doesn't have to reveal that to me because he's given me the here and now. Today, I know where we are, and I know what he has for us today. And I know that he gives me what I need. We pray often, Lord God, give us today our daily bread. We pray the most dangerous prayer you can ever pray, but do we need it when we pray Not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. That is the most dangerous thing you can pray because you are saying that I am giving it all to you, Lord God. What do you have for me? We pray it, but do we live it? If we stop and we accept where he has brought us, When he says, he makes me lay down in green pastures. He makes me lay down in green pastures. If I'm in his will, I am where I'm supposed to be. This is where I should be. Only when you say, Lord God, where will you have me? Lord God, put me where I need to be. Only then can you move to the second part of that scripture. When you fully accept it. Then you can go to 23, 2b, which says, he leads me beside the still waters. Until I accept that he's the shepherd, that he's control, I can't be led. It says what? It said you can lead a horse to water, but you can't what? You can't make them drink. If I'm so stubborn that I won't take and partake of what he leads me to, then he's not my shepherd. I've got to be willing to be led. We have got to have our antenna up, if you will, whatever it may be, that we're always wanting to be in sync with God's will what he has for this church, what he has for us as individuals. Once we accept that life-sustaining pasture, that he's meeting all of our needs, then we can actually go back to 23.1 because you understand how the Psalms are written. The Psalms are written in poetry, but they don't rhyme a word. It's not like, I will not eat it in a box. I will not eat it with a fox, that kind of stuff. They rhyme in thoughts. And they don't always rhyme in the order we think we do. They rhyme in their thoughts and they go back and they go back. And I believe that once you get to the point to where you can allow him to let you lay down where you need to be and allow him to put you where you need to be and you can allow him to lead you, then you can go back to 23.1 and honestly say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I'm going to show you that he's the Lord is my shepherd. I'll show you that I shall not want because I'm going to let him lead me where I need to be. And I'm going to let him give me what I need in the time that he wants to give it to me. Understand that whenever we read this, that the sheep are brought into the pasture. Sheep do not lay down until they are fed and satisfied. That is it. They will not lay down until fully fed and fully satisfied. That their wants and their needs from verse 1 are fully met. And I've got to say this morning to all the people watching, if you happen to be in a congregation or you have to be under a shepherd, and you don't feel that your needs are being fully met, that you're not being fed, you know what I'm going to challenge you to do? I'm going to challenge you not to look at your shepherd and in their position. I'm going to challenge you to look in your position as a sheep. Are you willing? Are you willing to be led? Are you willing to sit underneath someone's authority, a true under shepherd? We have to be willing for whatever God has for us. And that's so hard for us to do. We're so strong-headed. We're, we grow up in a country where we're a democracy, every, you know, all these things. Well, in the kingdom of God, it may be a democracy, but you know what? Everybody gets a vote, but not every vote counts. It's a democracy led by only one, and that is God. 
Because that's a dictatorship. I don't care how you want to rule it. He is the shepherd. He is a shepherd. I'm not going to go say, well, we need to go eat over there. Look what the grass they got. Look what they got. We want what they got. You know, they did that in Israel, and they said they wanted a king. We want a king. God said, all right, I'm going to give you one. That's what you want. You want a good, strong leader that's going to lead you by the nose? I'm going to give you one. He'll always give the people the leader that they deserve, not always the leader that they want. We have to be willing to yield. Whenever we yield and we lay down in the pasture where he has placed us, then he can lead us to the waters. Then we can drink freely from the still waters. The pasture provides the food and the home we need. The green grass even has enough moisture for us to survive. We could be there in the pasture. You know, I used to wonder how these sheep, mountain goats, and I live up here in the high elevations. No water. They get enough moisture from the grass. There's enough in there. You can be sustained just there in the pasture, just living in what God has provided. But there's more. He wants to lead us to more. You have to realize that when you look at the word more for God and he leads you beside the still waters, he's not talking about a reservoir. He's talking about a river. You cannot suck dry the things that God has for you. It's ever replacing and ever refreshing. You let that pour through you. You let what God has pour into you and then you pour it out into someone else's life. That's what a river of life looks like. All I am here for on Sunday morning is to equip you so you can pour into someone else's life this week that I do not know. There are people I don't know, and there are people that if I knew them, they wouldn't listen to me, but they'll listen to you. And your job is to pour into their lives. The water. You realize how important it is that you're in the pasture. I got all I got. I got all I need. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I need something else in our lives. And that's what the water does. It nourishes and it refreshes I have to, at some point in time, have the ability to be able to go and I don't want to just put my toe in the water. I want to jump in and cover head to toe. I need, Lord God, I need you to pour out upon me, pour over me, pour through me. I need that. We used to hold revivals every few months and we meet for a week or we did a three-week revival one time. But that's all great. That's all wonderful. But I need that every day. I need to be camped out on the edge of the river. I need to be ever having him flow through me. But God doesn't make you go to the water. Scripture says the good shepherd leads you beside them. You must choose to go in. As I said, as the little S shepherd, I strive to lead you, and I tried to lead you to sound doctrine. You know, the only sound doctrine I can ever find is right here in the Word of God. This is it. This is all I have to be able to offer you to be able to drink from. I can give you other little things and quotes and all, but you know what? They're going to have to align with the Word of God or they are useless. They're polluted waters. This is the pure, unpolluted, inerrant, I can say that right, Word of God. God said it, I believe it, and that's enough. This is my only source. I'm not going to bring you the raging waters. I'll never have a service that I preach here, I bet, that's going to end up on TikTok or whatever, these little 15-second, 45-second, what they got, reels or whatever. With the, you know, all these TV preachers, I ain't going to raise, mention their names, but oh, yeah, people share them. They come in, they say something, blah, 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 and then everybody shares it, and it's wonderful. Raging waters, you know, shoot, the, the rapids, that's, that's great, that's wonderful. I'm never going to give you that. I would love to. If I could, I'd run up and down these pews nonstop. And I mean, we would, I, would just, I would just be non, I just, that would just be me. I'd love to. I'm not going to give you that. God hasn't given me that. God has given me instead the ability to pour out to you slowly by cup full, by cup full, by cup full, the word of God. That's it. And that doesn't play well on TV like they say. What I'm going to do is be able to give you what I can give you. When I was young, we used to go and we've whitewater rafted. You ever done that? And the raft's going and it's bouncing off the walls and everything. That's wonderful. That's great. You know what I want? I want a nice little slow-moving river. That's what I want. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to sit in an inner tube and float in the sun down. What's that little one over there by Oakdale or whatever? Whiskey or 
yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Give me a canoe. Give me a paddle. Let me have something I can do to direct a little bit, just a little bit. But yet I still know that God's bringing me down. But he's going to let me think I'm in control. He's not going to have me spinning around and getting sunbaked in a tube. Me and him are just going to go right on down. And that's how I do when I read the Word of God. I go through and every now and then I say, Oh, Lord God, that reminds me of something. I take my paddle and I go over here and I read that and I'll come back over. That's why I don't do well with all the cross-reference Bibles because I'll start and try reading and I'll go over here and it'll read me to here and it'll bring me to here and it'll bring me to here and it'll bring me to here. Next thing you know, I'm in the paddle, paddling upstream going nowhere. I'm like, wait, hold on, God. We were going somewhere. So I turn back around, and God brings me right back to where we were headed. That's what I want. I want to be there with God and just be able to experience the water, experience the fact of knowing that he's moving me. Because I know when I get in the middle of these things these other pastors are able to do and these jump up and down messages and they're able to preach and holler and shout, They bring me back to one thing over and over again, which is Jesus there in the boat with the disciples, and the storm is going, and everybody is hollering and screaming. And Jesus speaks two things. He says what? He says peace, and then he says what? Be still. I believe he spoke peace to the wind and the waves, and he spoke be still to the disciples. And I think sometimes, and we're Holy Ghost Spirit-filled people. We ain't supposed to be still. I think sometimes we need to be still, and we need to drink from what God has for us, And then he's going to pour a little bit out for us, a little bit out for us, a little bit out for us, and he's going to wait until we're ready for what he has for us. He can lead you there, but you must choose to accept the offer to enter that rest found in the still water. But the first part says he makes me lie down in the green pastures. You do realize God can and God will make you do things. If you're truly yielded to him, he will make you do things. He will make you lie down. I love the Apostle Paul. I love the Apostle Paul. If I could pick anybody out, I'd probably want to be the Apostle Paul. Chances are I'm more Peter, but I want to be Paul. But the Apostle Paul, what did he do? He went, he went, he went, he went here, he went there. He'd go here and he'd have a dream and he'd run over here. I got to go over here and I got to go over here and I got to go and I got to go and I got to preach. I got to preach messages so long that they fall asleep and fall out the window and die. But you know what I do? Then I run outside and I pray for them and they come back to life again. And we go back in and still what? Continue to preach. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to do. Paul, I got something for you. What's that? I want you to write. I want to write what? Write a letter? Yeah, I want you to write a letter. Then I want you to write another letter. I want you to write another letter. I want you to write the majority of the New Testament. Okay, what's the New Testament? You just write. I ain't got time to write. I got you, Paul. It's that big tall fellow with the spirit. He's fixing to put you under house arrest and you're going to be in your house. They're going to feed you. They're going to take care of you. Your friends can come and go. You've got access from Rome to the world's greatest mail system. I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you time to write. And you're going to write. And you're going to write some more and you're going to write some more and you're going to write some more and you're going to write. You will stop and you will do what I need for you. How about it may be in the fact that God may come to you and say, you know what? I need, you, I need to see your dependence on me. I, we need to work out. Brandon told me he's been working out. God may say, I need to work your faith out. You know what? You're getting that good paycheck every two weeks. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's see if maybe all of a sudden you don't get a paycheck. Let's see what unemployment does. Let's see what that does. Instead of getting up at 5 in the morning to rush to work, why don't you get up at 5 o'clock and get to your knees and let's pray for your daily bread. Let's see, put your faith on me. You willing to do that? You willing to do that? God, whatever you need me to do, that's what I'm here for. You're going to yield to that rest God has offered. You never know what God may bring to you. It may be that you find time in a hospital. Oh, I don't know. God wouldn't do that to you. Let me tell you this. If you don't take time to take care of your body, your body will make time for you to take care of your body. This is given to us a, a temple. We have been made stewards over this body, and we are to take care of it. If we do not take care of it, God's going to have somebody else take care of it. He's going to have the fact that he called nurses and technicians and doctors. Fine, I'm going to use their call, and they're going to take care of you. You're going to lay right there in that bed. Maybe you got a situation going to pop up in your life that's going to bring you to your knees in prayer. 
You ever had that? How about this? You ever had something in your life pop up that's so strong that you couldn't eat? Who it's rough if it hits our appetite, right? You ever gone through something so bad, something so horrible that you couldn't even eat? All you could do is lay on the floor and pray out to God. That one word prayer we talked about earlier, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you ever been in that situation? I want to tell you why God's going to put us in that situation sometime. It's because if you don't make time for a fast, a fast will be forced upon you. We're in a 21-day fast right now. And I think it's one of its main reasons to be able to prepare us for what's to come. We're specifically fasting that God will open us up to be open to evangelism, to the spreading of the good news, to be focused on what we need to do to expand his kingdom, not to grow this church, but to grow his kingdom. And if we elect not to choose to fast, I think a fast will be forced upon us. You will find a reason that you're going to be on your knees at least once a day, a reason why you're going to be forced where you cannot eat, and all you can do is focus upon what God has given you, what God has laid upon your heart. Maybe you've found your place there in the, the pasture, but maybe you haven't let yourself be led to the river. God's not going to force you to drink. God is a gentleman. Jesus Christ is a gentleman. He's never going to force you. It says in the scripture that he lay, He leads me. He leads me. Primarily, the one thing I can tell you this morning, especially all of those that are watching that I don't know, that are out there, he will never force you to drink from what was offered to the woman at the well salvation he will never force you into that he offered the woman at the well he offered her the gift of salvation it was in john chapter 4 verse 14 he says but those who drink the water i give will never be thirsty again it becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them giving them eternal life those who drink he does not force them there is no one that god forces into salvation that is not the way that he works. We have those in our families we know who need salvation. What we do is we continue to pray and we continue to be able to show them an example of what God has done in our life. But there's no way we can force them. I can't beat them over the head with the word of God. That will not do it. Like we said, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Lead. The Lord will lead, but you must be willing to yield to him and accept that what he has for you is good. He's called us in his pasture, a place to leave behind worry, anxiety, and depression. He said, I have brought you here, and I want you to accept what I have for you. Because he's offered us eternal life, but he's also offered, like we said earlier, abundant life, John 10, 10. It's there, but we have to accept it. We, as Christians, have to show others that we're accepting of what God has given to us, this life that he's given to us, this life without anxiety. Jesus told us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, and again, this is an, a calling. This is not a forcing. And he says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy loading, burdens, and then I will give you rest. He's not going to force it upon us to be able to rest in his word we have to be willing we have to yield to him will you accept that that's that's offered this morning i have to ask that first thing question i'm gonna ask is will you accept the life-giving eternal life that comes from the very blood of christ that was shed that fountain that comes up that gives us if if we choose to freely accept eternal life any in the building here that need to accept Christ, that have never accepted Christ Jesus before, any of you that need to choose today to drink from that well, to receive the eternal life, to let go of the burdens that you bear, the anxiety, the depression, everything that's hanging on you, to leave it right here in the altars, or anyone this morning that needs to accept Christ for the first time. Well, then we all fall into the second category. Are there any here that have burdens that we need to lay down and we need to enter into his rest and we need to be willing to drink from what he has offered to us 
which is an abundant life. You've already taken of salvation's fountain. You've already immersed yourself in the baptism. You've already experienced those things that Christ has for you. But there's more. You must be willing to yield to his rest and you must be willing to be led into those waters which flow with an abundant life here on earth. To be able to willing to have him pour into you. I told you, I've already preached that myself over and over and over again. And I have to pray a deadly, a dangerous prayer. I have to pray, Lord God, whatever it is that's between me and you, whatever, Lord God, is blocking me from entering into that rest, Lord God, take it away. I don't know what it is. And you know what? He's a good shepherd and it doesn't matter. Lord God, you identify what I need. What in my life, Lord God, is keeping me from entering into those waters of refreshing and nourishing? And Lord God, because if I have filled myself with the word, with the word, if I fill myself with that water, if I filled myself, then you know what? There's only one thing I can do, and that's pouring it out into others. If you don't have the desire to pour out into others, then you know what? That means you don't have it fully within you. If you are so filled with the Word of God, so filled with the love of God, so filled with the desire to please Him, then you have to want to pour that into the lives of others. If you don't have that unquenchable desire to spread the true good news of Jesus Christ with others, then something's wrong. I know that the word of God will not return void. So if we are all here in this building spreading the word of God to others, then we will see others daily added to his kingdom. And if I don't see it, it's not because God's word failed. It's because we are somehow blocking that stream. There's nothing I can specifically do to bring anyone to heaven, but I can stand as a stumbling block. I can be a dam keeping that flow coming into them. I can be a hindrance. God doesn't necessarily need my help. God doesn't need me to be his lawyer. God doesn't need me to defend him. But what God does need me to do is allow him to work through me into the lives of others. If you're willing to do that, I want you to stand with me this morning. If you're willing to let God flow through you into others, I want you to stand with me this morning. If you're not, stay seated. But if you're willing to let God pour into you, to fill you up and allow you to be used as a conduit to pour into the lives of others, then I want you to stand with me because, Lord God, I want to proclaim this morning that we stand in agreement that, Father God, whatever you need to do, Lord God, to bring us into the pastures, Lord God, you have prepared for us meeting our needs. And then, Lord God, allowing us to be led into the waters, Lord God, that refresh, that nourish, that renew so that we can share that with others. Lord God, in the example of the woman at the well, we know that it took root because she went out and she went into the village and she told them all, you've got to come see this man who told me everything about me. She let them know what little she knew of Christ. Lord God, we stand here today that whoever you bring in our lives, we're going to pour into them everything we know of you and we're going to fill ourselves with what we know of you because we're going to dedicate ourselves to your word. I pray, Father God, for renewing this week of those who seek, Lord God, to find you. Lord God, as we enter into a fast, Lord God, believing for those, Lord God, that would come into this body not to grow the numbers, not to grow the bank account, but Lord God, to ever daily increase the kingdom of God. Lord God, let us exist for no other reason than to share your love with others. I pray now upon all of you gathered here in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that you will find a new found affection for the gospel and a new almost unquenchable desire to be able to share that gospel with others. I pray, Lord God, a blessing, Lord God, to health, to be able to sustain all of those that go forth in this place. Father God, I send out of here missionaries, Lord God, messengers, angels, Lord God, to be able to bear your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you all for your faithfulness. Thank you all for your attendance and your attention. And now we'll look to reap the reward. Amen.